there are moments that exist on a higher dimension. Invoking a supernatural, mysterious, unseen ally, divine enigmas, with the power to rewrite history and transcend time that defy all logic when heaven touches earth when heaven touches us hearts will be healed blind will see dead will be raised storms will be calmed sins will be forgiven Mountains move. Nothing is impossible. Miracles still happen. All right, good morning. It's so good to be here with you this morning. I didn't know that I would be. For those that didn't know, I was really sick yesterday. For the parties I missed yesterday, I am sorry. The pictures I finally saw later on were amazing, so I will make it up to you. Um, But I kept telling Pastor Erica, no, she's like, we're going to cancel. And as my head was in a bucket throwing up, I said, just give me a minute. Let me try to figure this out. Because as a guy, right, we can always fix whatever's going on. But it's no accident that this sickness came on me. It's not contagious, although James would beg to differ because he's dealing with the same symptoms Um, right before we preached our spiritual warfare series back in, I think, December into January, and then right before we start this miracle series, I got whammed with it, and I mean, it was just miserable yesterday. Um, My head in a bucket, crying out to God, because I didn't know what to do. And then needing to throw up and not being able to, I don't want to get into graphics, but praise God, we're here today, and I think... Even this morning when I tried to lift my head up to worship God, the room started spinning. So I'm fighting through it, and I'm going to try to just keep staring straight ahead. Um, But I think God wants you to hear something, wants us to hear something. Maybe it's just for me, but I know that I've had texts and messages throughout this week of people going through stuff and and wanting to just give up. And some of the people that I wanted to hear this message aren't here this morning, so I'm hoping that they'll hear it online or come in late. For the next three weeks, we're going to talk about miracles. And for those that have been in church their whole life, yes, there are going to be miracles that Jesus did. So you've heard the story in Children's Church. You've heard the story up here. But my prayer that it would be more than folklore, more than just a story, but it would be a testimony of what God did and what God is still doing today. Amen? So open up your hearts this morning to do that. Manny, the the lawn looks great this morning. Thank you for that. I would have called you back, but my head was in the bucket. I'm sorry. And for those that did reach out, I'm sorry I didn't get back to you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But something I forgot this week. We Christians that have been saved a long time can be overly religious when we're talking to somebody. Somebody told me something that happened. I'm like, but brother, God will make a way. I said, but God's done it before. And he's like, not in my life. Because he's a new believer, right? So we Christians, I have seen God do miracle after miracle after miracle. And a lot of us have. But some of you guys haven't seen those miracles yet. So guess what? Buckle up, buttercup. Because I believe God wants to perform miracles that you've never seen before. So if you're in need of a miracle, I'm believing over the next three weeks through the power of God, your open heart and your little bit of faith, God will do something. But Christians, remember that when you're, hey, brother, God is good. It's going to happen. Those are Christian cliches that might keep people out of church. So, hey, I sympathize that you're going through that. You lost your job. You're getting evicted. This, you're sick, you're this. Hey, I don't have the answers. I don't know why good things happen to bad Bad things happen to good people. Yes, yes. But I know a God that has those answers, amen? So that's what we point them to. So in the laws of the universe, there are things that God set in place. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He created order. 
the natural laws that govern the earth. The earth revolves around the sun. The move around revolves around the earth. Gravity, we've all had to learn about gravity, right? We've all fallen down, gotten bumps and bruises. First and second laws of thermodynamics. These are laws that God set into place. A miracle is when God chooses to operate outside of those natural laws. So sometimes it can blow our mind. How could that possibly happen? But let me tell you this morning, we serve a God of miracles. The late Tim Keller, who recently passed away, said this. We modern people think of miracles as the suspension of the natural order. But Jesus meant them to be the restoration of the natural order. Because before sin came into the world, before there was death, before Eve took a bite of the apple, the supernatural was known as Tuesday. Because sin hadn't entered the world. So the supernatural was happening all around. Today we're going to look in in John chapter 11. At a story that will go through the bulk of it this morning. If you need a Bible, slip up your hands. Somebody will throw one at you. If you need a Bible, Jake will take care of you. If you need a Bible on the way out, they're on the welcome center as well. John chapter 11. It will also be on the screen. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death, No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. I think it's funny how Mary said, the one you love, Jesus. I know like when we get text messages from each other, right, you you sometimes can infer tone. So we don't know Mary's tone. But to me, when I read it this time, I almost felt like, you know, when like one of my kids does something and then Erica will go, your son did this. All of a sudden, he's my son, right? But some of us parents do that. Lydia might say, Manny, your sons did this today. But maybe Mary was saying it that way. The one you love, Jesus. The context of this, Bethany is two miles east of Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is in between where they are. This is the same Mary who anointed Jesus, although it hasn't happened yet. It was written about 70 AD. Bethany was a safe place for Jesus. When he was tired and he just needed fried chicken and hang out, this was where he would go to Bethany. If there was Chick-fil-A back then, that would have been the headquarters. Lazarus was just a guy. He wasn't famous. He didn't do TED Talks. Nobody really knew who he was. But him and Jesus hung out, had coffee, and Jesus was over his house quite often. Back then, if they had Catan, they might have been hanging, playing Catan, and making pizzas. You never know what could be happening back then. He was just somebody that Jesus liked to hang out with. They were friends. Back to John chapter 11, verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So we see clearly in Scripture the bond that is between them. So when he heard that he was sick... He then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Does your Bible say that too? Because to me, that doesn't make sense. That conjunction, so he stayed two days longer. The Bible doesn't say, but there was traffic, so Jesus couldn't get back there. Jesus was afraid of opposition. It said, so, like you almost expect, so Jesus knew his loved ones were sick. So Jesus made a beeline and got there. That's not what scripture says. Scripture says, so Jesus stayed a few extra days. Hmm. So often those of us who are believing God for a miracle have to first learn the lesson on how to wait on the Lord. And I don't know about you, I don't like waiting for certain things. 
We flew last weekend and we had a lot of delays and layovers, this, that, and the other. I've been praying for a healing for my sickness. I don't like to wait. But there's something about waiting on God that teaches us lessons. It's part of it. If we look back through the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's example after example of God giving the vision, a burden, a promise, and then crickets. There's waiting. Raquel's a prime example of waiting. I didn't ask her permission to use her, but I will, I will keep using her until the day this church is so big I can't see her, and then I'll still do it. I didn't know where I was going with that. So, But Raquel needed lung transplant. She was in God's waiting room for years, and that she still came to church toting her, her um, oxygen tanks. Even when she was having to change them multiple times, she pressed in. But I don't know what it's like when she had to wait on God for something that she was going to die from. The reality of it is, right? We need our lungs to breathe. But Raquel was in the waiting room of life. When we look at this story of Mary and Martha and the waiting It's only been a few days, but when someone you love is suffering and hurting, those few days can feel like an eternity. When do you do, when you've begged God for something, when you've asked him and you don't get it? And it's not like you're asking for a Porsche or a boat. You're not asking blessings over your meal and traveling mercies. You're praying prayers that I need you, God, now. Without you, God, I don't see how we'll be out of this. What happens to your faith when you've prayed that? Then you're waiting, and it seems like God is not listening. Or things get worse. I prayed a prayer with someone this week. God, show them in the next 36 to 48 hours that you were Jehovah Jireh. I mean, I had the powerful prayer. My office was rocking. I believed so much something was going to happen to this guy. Calls me two days later. Pastor Rob, I got fired. Tell me that's the prayer that you pray that God would show me? I said, that's not the God we serve. God still has something for you. But he's like, bro, I don't know how to press in like you're talking. So I just said, you have to press in. You have to read scripture. I I helped some of his physical needs that day, and I prayed with him again. But what do we do? I think some of us this morning have spent some time in that spiritual waiting room while we're waiting and waiting on God. Something God has taught me is a divine delay is not a denial. Sometimes we mix up a delay with God saying no, and that's not often the case. Or you think a divine delay is God ignoring you. I can assure you that every prayer you've uttered, God has heard. Every tear you've cried, God has seen. So many times when we're in between the burden and the fulfillment, the prayers and God's answer, we don't realize God is doing a deep work preparing us for when he does those fulfillments. Our our first glance about the story of Lazarus, we think it's about Lazarus. But spoiler alert, Lazarus dies and Jesus raises him from the dead. But this miracle is more of a foreshadowing of the significance of Jesus' death and resurrection. However, Mary and Martha, like many of us, couldn't see anything other than their spiritual disappointment. If I ask for a raising of hands and I won't, there'd probably be almost 100 people, every, 100% that would say, yes, I've been spiritually disappointed at one time in my walk with the Lord. So they experienced spiritual disappointment, but then they allowed that to cloud them and what they thought of God. So how do we navigate the times when God's purpose conflicts with our expectations of him because we expect God to do something in this time period, but God's looking at eternity and he has a better plan. You've prayed that this is urgent, God. I need you. Please show up. There is no way. 
something that was in my notes. And this guy said to me, he said, there's no way this is God's will for my life. There's no way that God wants me to be on the streets. There's no way God wants me to go back to doing this. And I said, absolutely. He goes, but I don't know what else to do. Please show up, God. Then nothing happened. Time passes. I love you, God, but I'm honest. I haven't got over the hurt that you still haven't answered that prayer. I've prayed and I fasted and still I love you, but my soul is troubled. And I don't understand why you didn't or you chose to wait. Something God has been teaching me is this. The moment we define God's love for us by him doing what we need him to do, we have chosen to live with a troubled soul. Let me say that again. The moment we define God's love for us by him doing what, he, what we need him to do, we have chosen to live with a troubled soul. And some of us have some troubled souls this morning. I ask you this, God, I've ugly cried at the altar for this and then nothing. We've all had troubled souls at times. So what do you do in your faith when you're attached your expectations to God, to his purpose? You're living with a troubled soul. Can I encourage you this morning that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than ours. Why God would choose to take certain people home during the pandemic, I don't know. And I cried those tears with many of you too. But God has a plan and a purpose that far goes beyond Pastor Rob's mind. And we need to be grateful that he doesn't do things the way we think he should do them all the time. Because we don't always know what he knows. If you let anger, doubt, and spiritual disappointment persist too long, it will rob you of your faith. There's example after example in the Bible of miracles that didn't occur when people lacked faith. So don't give up. So this morning, how do we reconcile a troubled soul? If we fast forward a couple days, he tells the disciples who are concerned with the dangers of travel, he said, Jesus said, Lazarus is asleep. So the disciples were probably thinking, great, sleep could do good to him. Then Jesus clarified, no, he's dead, but it'll all be good. So John eleven seventeen, 17, we jump back in. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Four days is important. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about 15 stadia away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. So then Martha, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet with him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Here is my, here's the thought this morning. How do we deal with having a troubled soul? It's worth learning to pray honest prayers. I talked a few weeks ago about praying big ask prayers. This morning we're talking about praying Honest prayer. God, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. She chose to just have honest prayers. Like really honest. This is God. He already knows what you're thinking. You can't hide it from him. But it's okay sometimes when you're crying out at your altar or here. God, this is how I feel. Mary and Martha are not happy, but they're grieving in different ways. Mary doesn't even leave the house. How many of you can reconcile with that, right? Some of us don't want to leave the house at times. You ask God for something, it didn't happen, you're like, peace out, I'm just staying home. Or you are still a Christian, but you won't be asking for things much anymore. Pastor Rob talks about big ask prayers, and God, you haven't answered them, so you know what? The next time he tells me to pray, I'm going to be like, yeah, whatever. You still have that relationship with God, but you gave up asking for those things. Maybe the five you put on that paper, none of them have come to church yet, but you've heard testimony about other people, and you're like, well, God, what about my five? What about the tears I've cried about these five? And then you just give up. I get that feeling. Martha, unlike Mary, doesn't even let him reach the edge of town when she makes a beeline for him. 
She had to get to Jesus. But Jesus met both of them where they were at. So whatever situation you're at, whether you feel like you need to stay in your house or you show up at church at 7.15 this morning hoping it was open and then you had to wait till the worship team gets here, that impresses my faith. And it's not the first time that there's been people wanting to get in the doors as soon as they're open to cry out and pray to God. And it's okay. Our worship team doesn't mind people chilling in the presence of God. Guess what? Monday nights, they're here worshiping too. Not this Monday night. They have off because of Memorial Day. But on most Monday nights, when the doors are open, you can come sit in the presence of God. It's okay. Jesus met both of them where they are. Some of you are saying, pray honest prayers. You're like, that's uncomfortable. To tell God how I really feel, that might even be borderline disrespectful. I don't think it's irreverence. I think it's intimate. My desire is that each of you have an intimate relationship with God. Not just the Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, breast of my food, blah, 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 rub it up, dub, thank you for the grub. An intimate one where you talk with God like you talk with me. Text with God. Converse with God. Because you can't have intimacy with a God that you're unwilling to be honest with. You have to be honest with God. I'm careful how I say this, because as you grow in your faith, you probably shouldn't curse as much. But I've been where people have been so honest that they're dropping F-bombs in their prayer to God, and guess what? God is listening, and God is feeling their pain. Yes, it's probably not the best thing to do. But I'm saying God can handle your anger. God can handle your disappointment. God can handle your tears. He just wants you to be honest with him. And when you're honest with God in your prayers, that brings your prayer life to a new level and you have that intimacy with God. Often there is a reason behind the delay. But when Jesus, excuse me, I jumped ahead. The funeral had come and gone. The green bean casserole is being put away. They've already told all the stories about Lazarus when he was 12 years old. Then Jesus shows up. When we are waiting on God, we are not waiting for nothing. A divine delay is not ever his denial. Often there is a reason behind the delay. Sergio told the story, I think it was in Bible study, about during our 21 days of prayer and fasting, this one I did get permission for. I didn't get it in writing, though. But during 21 days of prayer and fasting, a lot of us were praying for certain things. And he was very specific. He, at the time, he didn't tell me what it was. But the other night, he shared it, that he had been praying specifically for God to bless him in a promotion at work that's something that would help provide for the future of his family. He really wanted it, and the door was shut, and he didn't get it. So that was an answer, right? God gave him an answer, but it's not the answer Sergio wanted. Now, I didn't have this conversation with Sergio, but him being a good Portuguese boy, he probably was like, all right, God, thank you. Perfect, thank you. No, he probably had an intimate encounter with God and said, God, what the heck? He didn't understand. But then you fast forward so many weeks later, there's layoffs at Johnson & Johnson, and he found out if he had gotten that promotion, he would have gotten laid off. God's ways are higher than our ways. So if God says no or not now, it's okay. It's part of his plan. You've got to get that. And if you want to be blessed more, Sergio can tell you all the details about that that I missed or corrections. I just licked my finger to turn the page on the iPad. <laughs> now it won't turn. Because the moment we're honest, you know what you're doing. You're opening your heart in a vulnerable way so that God knows your struggles. He already knows your struggles, but you verbalizing them, you vomiting them out to him. We just have to pray honest prayers. So Lazarus is in the grave. The stone has sealed his fate. We need to learn to pray honest prayers. I've kind of felt that after 25 years of being a pastor, I would have a, a graduate degree in handling trauma. 
But no broken, angry, helpless people day after day come in and tell me about their struggles. And every day is new trying to tell them about our God who does answers prayers and does things, but they're in his time. So how do we reconcile a troubled soul? We learn to pray honest prayers. The next thing I ask for you to risk your heart again and believe in him again. Not just believe in him, because everyone that's a Christian, you already believe in him. But I'm asking you to believe in the supernatural again that our God still heals today. Our God still brings people back from the dead. Our God still does anything crazy that you could imagine. The Bible says more than you could ever imagine I'm willing to do. So whatever it is you're facing this morning, whatever the situation is, our God is able. You just have to believe. But not just believe with this. Yeah, Pastor Rob, I believe in the head. Yeah, right. Nope, never going to happen. The things that go on in my head. I was just thinking when you're praying at the altar, I think try to like this one. When you're praying at the altar, in the background, the devil's singing, never going to get it, never going to get it, never going to get it. Oh, 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 oh. But it's true. The devil plays mind games with us over and over again Rob, you're not worthy to get healed. Rob, you're not worthy. Rob, you know what you did back in the day. But I'm here to tell you that God has a future and a hope for every single person. So whatever it is you're facing, believe in him again to get it. Verse 22, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. This is what she's saying to him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise from the dead. Jesus is telling her it's going to happen. Martha's like, yeah, I know one day he will rise again when the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said, no, 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 no. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asked her. She said to him, yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Christ and the Son of God and he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she left and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard this, she got up and quickly came to him. For some, it takes courage to risk your heart and truly believe again. I love how Jesus met Mary and Martha where they were, even though they were handling things differently. So Mary comes, and in verse 33 we see, Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her were also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Then the shortest verse in all of Scripture but for some of us, the most important two words, Jesus wept. God wept. The creator of the universe cried. He fulfilled Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I promise you this, he wasn't weeping because Lazarus was in the tomb. Why would he cry for somebody that he knew he was going to raise from the dead? He saw their heartache and their tears, and he cried with them. I can promise you this, that every tear you've ever cried, Jesus has cried with you. He is with you. The Holy Spirit is a comforter, and he wraps his arms of love around you, and when you cry those tears, he's there with you. Do you believe that this morning? You're not alone. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. It's the nature of God, is that he chooses to enter into our suffering. There's a reason for which he may not remove it from you right now, but then he chooses to plant himself and position himself to walk through it with you. You are not alone. The Latin word for compassion is miscordia, misericordia, but it literally means to co-suffer. To suffer with you. He chose to enter into our pain. Every tear you've ever cried, let me encourage you, you have never cried alone. 
He has been with you the whole time. Believe in him again. Risk your heart again. Raquel, I think of the time that you were going to the hospital. They had a transplant waiting for you. And then pfft, it didn't happen. How many times did that happen? Three times she went to the hospital. We have lungs for you. Tears were cried by Heather, Reese, her husband, So many times, crying and crying. We would text. We would believe with her. We cried too. She probably had some honest prayers with God. She probably conversed with God. When no one else was around, the things she might have said. With that thought, our last encouragement this morning is this. Nothing is over until Jesus says it's over. Nothing. Say nothing. <laughs> nothing is over till he says it's over. The situation in your life could look impossible, dark and done. It is not finished until Jesus says it's finished. John eleven thirty eight 38 says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there is a bad odor. We get so preoccupied in the natural that when we're talking to God, the supernatural, we're still giving him excuses or, or this, that, or the other. Lord, it's going to smell, for he has been in there four days. The four days thing is significant because the Jews back then believed for three days after someone's death, that their soul was lingering above them. And at any time in those three days, they could go back into them. Why they believe this, I don't know. So it's no accident that Jesus waited for the fourth day. Because he wanted to make sure that nobody had a reason why Lazarus came out other than the miracle of God. Sometimes he's going to wait until there's only one explanation and I'm speaking to somebody this morning. You are not waiting for nothing. Keep on holding on and waiting. But I can tell you in his presence with you, and he has a purpose for you this morning. Sometimes God will wait until the expiration of your expectation. Why? So he can manifest his glorification. God will wait till your expectation has expired so then he can come in. Oh yeah, here it is, bam. Bam. And now, two lungs, no oxygen tank, running the food pantry again. Tell me my God doesn't do something. Right? <laughs> Raquel's a nobody special. I tell her she is, because she is. But what God can do for Raquel, God can do for you, and God can do for you, and God for do for you. But it might not be that you need lungs, but you need something. And whatever it is this morning, whatever the breakthrough is, God wants to meet you and provide for you. For the person I was talking about throughout the week, he needs an apartment, now he needs a job. What else, God, what can I do? And I said that to him yesterday on the phone or the day before. I said, God wants to prove himself to you that you didn't do it. Because as guys, we're always like, oh, we can figure this out, we'll do this. I even said that. I bet you Jared could get your job welding, or Josh knows people, or Sergio knows people, or blah, 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 blah. But then, then, oh, well, Pastor Rob or, or Jared got me the job, not God. The whole point of this miracle of Lazarus was to magnify and display the glory so that people would believe in him. It's gonna smell, Lord, Verse 40, then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I'm saying this out loud for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to him, take to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So
Sometimes he is going to wait for your expectation to expire so he can display his glory so that you and those around you can see what God has done. I believe the anointing of God comes with a prerequisite for pain. When God trusts us with suffering and empowers you to serve others who are also suffering because you know what it is. When this first happened to me, I was at the altar once praying for a teenager at at church years ago, and I was praying for them, but they wouldn't tell me what the prayer request was, but I could see the hurt and the pain in their eyes, and my heart broke, and I started to cry, and I didn't understand, and under the power of the anointing of God, I prayed out exactly what they needed, and it freaked me out. I remember going home being like, whoa, that was weird. But the Holy Spirit allows you empathy for people and feel their pain. So if you are a believer and a Christian, it's okay to feel their pain and be prompted to do things. Devin told the story before how he was prompted at work to tell somebody about Jesus. That can be a scary prompt. But never underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm thinking about Bruce this week. I haven't seen Bruce. I hope he's, let me text him. Boom, 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 boom. He might just give you a thumbs up, the firefighter thumbs up. Yeah, I'm doing good, man. Cool, man. But you never know the power of that text for him. Or be like, hey, Johnny, what's going on, man? How you guys doing today? You guys think I'm just bugging you or whatever. I just reach out because I love you guys. But you guys can do that too. Sometimes the power of the Holy Spirit will send a trot to send me a mem just to encourage me. But that works for all of you. We are the body of Christ. Together. The Holy Spirit is still moving and he's still speaking. If you don't hear him, there's an issue. Make sure there's no sin between you and God so that the Holy Spirit can speak to you. That still small voice to tell you different things. So this morning you might be saying, all right, Rob, that's great. But I did pray an honest prayer and I prayed for the cancer to go away and it didn't. You may have fasted, but the marriage still ended. All of this is great, but it's too late. My miracle hasn't come. I don't understand why and how God works, but I can tell you this. God is present in your temporary, but he's focused on your eternal. He knows the end game, the long game. Let me close with this. What Mary and Martha didn't grasp That this miracle wasn't about Lazarus, it was about you and me. This miracle set in motion the end which became our beginning. People were flocking now to Jesus and this miracle. They saw the healing power of the Lord and they were flocking to him. This was the last straw of the high priest Caiaphas who had it out for Jesus already. He was like, that's it, this guy has got to die. Following this miracle in John 12, Mary anointed the feet of Jesus, which was symbolic of his body being prepared for burial. After that was the triumphal entry, then Jesus' arrest, his torture, the crucifixion, to pay a debt that he did not owe, but we all owed that debt. Following that, he said, it is finished. Nothing is over till he says it's over. When he said this, once and for all, he was declaring the miracle has now occurred. And what is that miracle? Death is no longer the end. Death no longer has a sting. Why? Because Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies and everyone who believes and believes in me will never die. So I ask you this morning, do you believe it? Do you really believe it? Is it in your heart? Is it in your mind? Because if it did, you would act like it. Yes, do we have days where we're down? I was down yesterday. I questioned God, like why? But this morning when I was showering, I put on uh, worship, I just hit random, and Jaira came on. More than enough, more than enough. And I, I wish I could remember the line, but it's something, I'll be content in every circumstance, every circumstance. 
So I said, you know what, God, even though I don't feel good, I don't want to get up and go to church. Just being honest with you. I don't feel good. Every circumstance, God, I will be. Because I knew I could skip today and Pastor Eric could come up with something and do good. But that's not what God had planned for this morning. And the devil didn't want me here. I don't know why. But I'm telling you, be content in every circumstance. If you're in the waiting room of life right now, God is with you. Those tears that some of you are crying right now, God is crying with you. I feel it and so does he. And he has the answer. Pastor Rob doesn't, I'm nobody. But I'm going to point you to, the cross isn't there anymore. I'm going to point you to the God that is somebody. That died for each and every one of you this morning. Nothing is over till he says it's over. Stand up with me this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe this morning you've never heard about God in this way. You've never heard about Jesus. Or you've never ever accepted him in your heart as your savior. You want the hope that we're talking about. You want to know that you know that you know that when you die, you will go to heaven one day and you would like to accept them into your heart for the first time this morning. Just slip up a hand real quick so I can see it. Just it's, There's nothing special. I see that hand. I see that hand. Or maybe you just need to press in a little bit more. You need to be, shake off that discouragement Get out of that house, run to the gate, and have that honest conversation with God. Maybe that's you this morning. For those that wanted to ask the Lord in your heart, it's as simple as this. Just pray this prayer with me. Father God, come into my life this morning. Forgive me of my sins. Show me how to live my day by day. Thank you for coming into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, I want, to, I want to talk with you, give you a Bible, give you next steps. Now you're part of the family of God. <laughs> for the rest, of, the rest of us, let me pray. Father God, I lift up each heart that's here this morning, each troubled soul, Lord. And I pray this morning you'll teach us, Lord, to not only ask those big ask prayers, Lord, but also, Lord, to pray honest prayers because we know we can be honest with you, God, and you care. For those that need to feel your carpenter arms of love around them, I pray you'll give them a bear hug and pop their back, just squeeze them tight, Lord, let them know that you're with them. Wipe those tears away from their eyes and let everyone know that you are the God that is there with them, even in the middle of the night when they're by themselves and they're desperate and they don't know what to do. They just need to say, Jesus, and you're there, God. Bless your people, Lord, this morning. Bless our Portuguese as they come up next. Bless those that couldn't be here that might be listening online. Do a mighty work in your people through today, through this series, God. We thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, this pastor loves you. If you need prayer, feel free to come out. Come up here. See you Thursday.